been extremely good to all of us. And so we just want to welcome everyone to Whispering Hope, our weekly Sabbath school review. In the house today, we have Pastor Cindy Lee, and also we have Elder Bradley Mills, and I am your host, Cicada Challenger. And today we are beginning a new quarter, and we're looking at crucibles. You know, the Merriam Webster Dictionary defines crucibles as a severe test. You know, there are other meanings, but I think the one that speaks directly to what we'll be delving in this quarter has to do with severe testing trials. And so it promises to be an exciting study. So we ask everyone for this quarter to fasten your seatbelts. If you have struggles, if you have trials, then this quarter's lesson will, be a, will help to strengthen your faith because you're going to recognize, hey, I'm not the only one who have been tested and tried. And so I just want to encourage all of us to study to show ourselves a few. But before we jump into today's topic, this week's topic, the shepherd's crucible, we are going to bow our heads for prayer and we're going to ask Elder Bradley knows to pray for us to begin. Yeah, let's bow our heads while we pray. Father God, we are so grateful to you for all your blessings and your benefit towards us. Today, dear God, we recognize that the struggle is real, but also that you are with us. And so we know that, dear God, regardless of the difficulties that we may face, as long as you're with us, we will be victorious. I pray that as we get into the study of your word, that you may grant us wisdom, grant us understanding and clarity of thought. And I pray that everything may be done according to your names and in glory. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Shepherd's Crucible. Pastor Lee, can you please run us through a synopsis of this week's lesson, The Shepherd's Crucible? Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, now, this week takes us through the Psalm 23, this Shepherd's Psalm. And we have been on a journey through the shepherd's psalm. The, we see here there are two roads. There is Broadway and there's Straight Street. Straight Street is the path of righteousness where the shepherd leads his sheep. Straight Street, that is S-T-R-A-I-T, -E Straight Street is not a straight street. We see here that there are the journey meanders through the lowlands of pain and suffering. And there are two sites that are prominent. We have the Valley of the Shadow of Death and enemy territory. But as we see from the lesson, the shepherd knows the sheep, knows the voice of the shepherd and knows that whatever happens, the shepherd is ever present and will take care of him. Therefore, the sheep follows the shepherd, trusting his guidance. And there are three main points that came out. Number one, our life is a journey that takes, a diff that takes different turns. Secondly, although the path on which we traverse may take us through suffering and death, it is divinely orchestrated. And God has given us the assurance that he will lead us to salvation. And thirdly, the only way to survive the crucible of life is if we trust our shepherd to take us through them. God bless us as we go through the lesson for this week. Amen. You know, one of the first psalm that we've learned as children is the 23rd psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And it's quite interesting that we're looking at the shepherd's crucible today. And so we're going to go to our memory text that is taken from Psalms 23 and verse 3. And then to all of my wonderful panelists, we also have Elder Alson Jarvis joining us. Get ready to give us your take on our memory text. And our memory text, Psalms 23, 3 says, He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
And to Elder Jarvis, you're going to be the opening batsman. What's your understanding of our memory text? He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. I want everyone um, to be here as we look into this new lesson. Um, I've always found the 23rd Psalm to be an interesting one, especially you know, since it's one of those that we learned while we were young. Um, we, we, well, I, well, I can only speak for myself, maybe. Um, I got that when I was a wee lad. Um, if you think about, and I have had the um, unique opportunity to watch a friend of mine as a child who was the only male in the family take care of a large flock from a very young age. Um, and at times we would assist uh, in him doing so. And I recognize that it's an awesome responsibility. And um, subsequently, I have never had a pet because, uh, you know, you have to feed it, you have to do all of these things. And um, outside of the, the animal that I am, I am deathly afraid of, I, I never had a dog, you know. Um, but the, the, the 23rd Psalm speaks about someone who takes tender, loving care of those who are um, under his hand and it reflects who God is. He shepherds us, he takes care of us, he provides for our needs and more so when we have fallen into difficulties um, by various circumstances, the shepherd seeks after, the shepherd protects and the shepherd brings back to the fold. Uh, these qualities are pretty much what we really need to understand as the function of God and how he lovingly cares for us and does this one has this wonderful method that many of us need to mimic. We need to get to the place where we are able to actively perform and to um, have these attributes being reflected in our lives as we uh, interact with one another. But God is so, is so unique in his methods of operation that it's a shepherd that um, the analogy of a shepherd is used to bring about and to highlight those activities. He restores my soul and leads me in the path of righteousness. Um, how those things apply, you look at the previous verse where he says that he makes me to lie down in green pastures. So I'm always able to feed. I always have food and I always have water. The refreshing of the Spirit of God is worth word is the bread his word is the food the I, and he leads where i am able to follow him and be like him in every sense of the word i think i need to stop right here amen yes because you're running ahead and we're going to all of these texts today eleanor's you're mm -hmm. taking it fastly okay i'm um, interested enough um, we have to make a connection with the previous verse of the chapter which says he leads me beside still waters because the refreshing has to do with um, the drink that you would have gotten, right? So this is um, so important. And um, he said, uh, it goes on to say, he leads me in the path of righteousness for his Amen. namesake. So he, 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 he is defending his reputation. That's who he is. He's a good shepherd and he would lead to any part that is actually bad. And so the wonderful thing for me is that I recognize that here it is, that all things that the sheep needs are provided by the shepherd, right? So he, he, he gets the, the benefit of being the, the sole 
provider and sustainer. And I, and, and, and I love that so much about this um, particular sound. It's he who does everything. So I don't have to do anything where for my restoration and all these things. He takes care of me. Amen. Amen. Ashley? Yes. Um, when we look at this psalm, um, in Bible times, uh, uh, one of the main occupation was taking care of sheep. And the shepherd was committed to take care of his sheep. He would provide for it. And, and the writer of this, this psalm, David, was a shepherd. So he knew what it was to be a shepherd, to take care of his sheep taking them, providing, taking them to waters and food so that they could be well nourished. And even um, there were times when a sheep would go astray because if you know the characteristics of a sheep, you'd understand that it's not easy dealing with sheep. Sometimes they, they go their own way. In fact, animals in general, they go their own way and the shepherd has to go wherever to retrieve the sheep. And sometimes the shepherd has to go to some very difficult points, even risking his own life to take care of, to retrieve the sheep. And David here speaks about restoring my soul and, you know, looking at God as his shepherd. And Jesus himself says in that he is the good shepherd. And as the good shepherd, as David, look at how he takes care of his sheep. He looked at how God takes care of him. And he would have had many experiences where God protected him even while taking care of his sheep. David recounted when the, the bee and the lion came after him. It was not because of him, not because of his sling, but because of God's intervention while he was able to deliver the sheep and the, the lion and the bee did not make him a meal. And so just as how he was able to reach, risk his life, to retrieve a sheep or to pull a, a lamb out of the mouth of a lion or bear. He realized that God does the same for us. When even when we go our own way, God comes running after us. And um, he provides for us, he protects us. And even he leads us in the right path. He doesn't lead us astray, but God leads us where we would be well taken care of. And his presence is, goes always with us. Now in, in, our, in our area, in these parts, we would not understand the life of a shepherd because we have sheep and we just open the pen and we drive them to the pasture. They take care of themselves. And then they come home, they find them their way home. But back then in, in Palestine, when we look at the life of a shepherd who spent many months out there in the in the in the wild, taking care of the sheep, we'll understand what where David is coming from when he, he looks back at his life and see how God has led him. We'll understand that God is indeed a good God. He's a good shepherd. Amen. No, Sabbath afternoon begins with an interesting story. Here is a young lady by the name of Sophie. And she was betrayed by a friend, not just a friend, but a male friend. And the things she was saying about her really hurt her to the core. She couldn't understand why. And so she reached for her Bible and she came across our memory text, um, Psalms 23, verse 3. And then she went into verse 4. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, do I walk through the the of the shadow of death, I will say, you know, I'm trying to, how do we, in hard times, trust God? How do we claim the promises in Psalms 23, 4, that even though we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that we can trust God? I'll try this out to you, Elder Jarvis, and then to you, Pastor Elder Norris. Well, the thing is, um, the 23rd Psalm has both physical and, and spiritual applications. Um, the Apostle Paul says that first it happens in the natural and then it happens in the spiritual. In fact, naturally, 
God is the ultimate provider. He is the one who it, it takes care of us. He protects, he provides, he, he, he is the security. He's our surety. He's everything that we can imagine that he is. But the challenge that we face is, do I believe that? Do I accept that he's all of those things? Have I come to rely upon him? Do I know that he's trustworthy? Do I know that he's faithful? Do I know that he will come through for me whenever I am in a situation, whether it's of my making or not? Um, do I have that side, sort of faith which would activate um, that sort of response? The, when we find ourselves in situations, um, we question God, sometimes and we are not able to readily see any action it's like if god is waiting for something uh, waiting for us to do something waiting waiting sometimes seemingly forever before he responds and um, we know that that's not the kind of god he is the prophet daniel you know spoke towards, you know, the first day God said, from the first day you start to pray, and I sent a response, but the, the enemy stood in his way, you know, but we are a critical component in our own story. And how we respond and how we act in that story in response to God really determines what happens to us. You know, um, there are many times, simply, there are many times when God is waiting. He's there, present, and accounted for, uh, protecting us from even falling further into despair or the, the, the consequences of our situations. But he's encouraging us, and he is, as um, colloquially we say, coaxing us to turn to him, to look to him, to stretch our arms out and accept that which he has already made provision for um, in our natural situations. Um, so there, there, yes, there are times when persons may feel like um, this, 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 this passage is really not applicable because they don't feel that, that presence in their situation but it's really not deficiency of God. It is just that we need to make uh, another step or do a little bit more in um, to have, have our active situation be um, worked out in the way God would prefer it to work out. The muted sister challenger. Amen, Elder Jarvis. Thank you so very much for your take. Eleanor, it's your time. Yeah, um, I just want to do a little reality check. Okay? Because um, in our experience, in our spiritual experience, we dare not forget our humanity. Because there are times when serving God doesn't even make sense. When you're going through the difficulties you wonder what God is actually doing. Is he for real? Because there are people who are doing all kinds of foolishness and they seem to be going along and enjoying and while you who are trusting him for every single thing have to be going through the crucibles. But you know, the, the important thing is that um, we can understand that regardless, regardless of our situations, right? It is important that we understand that it is okay to question God because he wants to have that kind of relationship with us, okay? And so, and, and so we understand that even when you look at the Bible, the different um, characters in the Bible who went through the crucibles and they asked questions. Even John the Baptist said, are you really the Christ or should we look for another? Because in times of difficulty, our humanity tend to, you know, to, to outshine our, our spirituality, okay? Because um, what we feel physically 
it's, it's, it's generally not easy to deal with, especially when things are negative. And, and, in, and in a young lady's situation, when your good friend turn your back on you, you know how that is hard to deal with. However, having said all that, it is good to know that we can find comfort in the word of God. If we just pause for a while, we will um, understand, you know, as the Bible says, and as the songwriter so, uh, puts it so well, his goodness keeps running after us. We just need to pause and to see God. Just pause and to see him and to listen for a while. And, uh, and, and then the, the experience at the end of it, because um, let, let me say this, at, what we notice is that at the end of our experiences, and sometimes we come to the point where we can even laugh at ourselves. You know, this is this, this one thing we laugh at ourselves because when we look back then and then we saw how God's hand had been leading us and guiding us. And then we come to a moment of rejoicing. We can say, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Because if not me to go through it, then who should go through it? Because it's a means of joining us closer to God. As so I want to thank God and encourage people, no matter what you're going through, keep trusting God. Do not focus on what may be the reality at the given point in time, but focus on eternity and think about God and he will guide you through. Amen. I want to thank both of you, you know. I don't really have the time to go through all that I would like to say. So in difficult situation, it is God sometimes telling us to trust him. I've had some encounters in my life where I couldn't do nothing else but tell God, God, it's you. You know, even in my cancer diagnosis and surgery and all of that, I knew and I know it is God and still God working in my life. And so regardless to whatever the trial or the testing that crucible that you may be going through, trust God. Pastor Lee, your honor. Yes. Um, this lesson this week really appealed to me. In fact, the story because I've been going through a particular situation like this. And um, for the last months, well, almost a year now, it has really put me in a situation where at times I am at a very low point where as I go through my crucibles, I sometimes become withdrawn and um, you know, I just want to be alone. And I wonder what is God doing at this point? You know, you going through such situation. And in fact, before I, I came to the lesson this week, the lesson for this week, I was going through a low period in my life this week. Um, and when God drew me through to download the lesson for this week, when I downloaded the lesson, I, and I saw the story and the lesson, what it's about, the shepherd's crucible, it really did something for me. And when we look at the meaning, one of the meanings of um, crucible, it says it's a pot in which metals or other substances are melted or heated at a very high temperature. And then I remember a quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy, um, the book, Ministry of Healing, which says, God does not cast base metal into the fire. It is precious ore that he refines. So I know that God, through it all, God is refining me. And as the, the, um, Job says, he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as good. Amen. This is to tell The thing is, the, there are, for many of us, we only understand the pain of our present situation. We don't have God's foreknowledge, his foresight. And um, as was just indicated, the process of purifying gold is to put it on the intense heat. And when we think about how that applies to our Christian experience, you know, many of us are not willing to go through these intense pressure situations in order for us to be refined. Um, the, 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 there is a unique challenge with our humanity that we prefer things to be easy. But I want to understand that it is not about God trying to see who we are. He already knows. It is for us to know who we are, 
when we go through situations so that we can see how much trust we have, how much more we need to have, what level of faith we have, and so forth. It is really not about God testing you to know what you can do. He wants us to know what we can do. He wants us to know where we are with him. Amen. I want to thank you so very much. You know, because even this week, as Pastor Lee said it, when I studied this lesson, it touched me. I don't know if it did for all of us in different ways. Because when I look at my young life, you know, I've been through so much, you know, after diagnosis of cancer, coming to God worked miraculously in a matter of years. I lost my eldest brother and my aunt in my life trying to figure and to find God in all of, all of this. They died a week apart, same cancer. And, you know, you get to the point when you have no other choice but to trust God. It's where you have nothing else to do but to look up and say, God, this is all in your hands. You, you lead. Because the testing of this life, if we're not anchored in Christ, can take us to doubts and to even cause us to lose our faith and our trust. And so, Kosovo's, God designs them in our lives to strengthen us, to purify us. The, the heat that is used to purify metal is extremely hotter to get your impurities out. And so to anyone in Whispering Hope land who may be tried and tested and may be wondering what's going on, look at Job, look up. And we get right back to our lesson, a guide for the journey the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Again, I'm going back down the same order. Elder Jarvis, Elder Knowles, Pastor Lee. When we hear this text, I'm giving you two questions in one. What comes to your mind? And again, I want you to pull out the imagery of that shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So I want the imagery. What comes to your mind? When you see that shepherd and two, what do you understand by this text? I shall not want. Well, um, for us as human beings, we have a tendency to desire control. We want to hold the steering wheel and especially the steering wheel of our own lives. Now, when you think of having a shepherd, someone who directs guides, um, it tends to give us the feeling that we don't ultimately have control. And uh, that is a challenging concept for a lot of us, even as Christians. The, the facts are, um, you know, there's this song that, that said, Jesus, take the wheel, take it from my hand, uh, the, 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 the statement really should be, Jesus, here's the wheel. I'm giving it to you. Uh, he, he's not going to forcibly take it. He's going, to, he's going to accept it when we offer it to him. And it is, it is challenging sometimes when things are not going the way in which we would like that we, you know, we double down and we become gritty and we take a firmer grasp of the controls in order to steer it into the direction that we want it to go. However, as Christians, we are, we are required to take our hands off, to, 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 to step back. We have a responsibility, but it is not for us to try and control the workings of things. And God here He's more than able to direct and and to to you know to steer things in the best way for our best good. We may not always see it, but we need to expect that all things work together for our best good. Now, um, I shall not want. What does that really mean? Is it that I will never be out of anything? Everything I want, I will always get. 
uh, it's unlikely that's the situation. But what is it that we want? What is our ultimate desire? If salvation and heaven at last is, then everything that we go through is to get us to that ultimate goal. And our wanting of that, our wanting of even some earthly things can be placed aside. We're able to put, a bit, put them in perspective and have a better understanding of what God expects. And so we will know that our wants, but the, but the Bible even indicates that when we come into a relationship with God and it is of um, a solid, even a solid situation, even our wants would be, um, would be given. But it's just that what we think we want is not necessarily what we will want. So it's, it's, it's really a, sometimes catch 22, but um, it's God's way as opposed to the way. The imagery, what imagery do you see, Elder Jarvis? When you think of this shepherd, Lord is my shepherd, what do you see? Well, for me, it's really about um, the whole um, suggestion of um, being led, being um, guided step by step. And it, it really speaks to the first part of what I said about us preferring to hold the wheel. Because when you have um, someone who guides you, 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 you go to them, you expect the, the directions. Um, it's like your roadmap. It's like your, um, your, 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 your Google map app. You know, you punch in your address and it tells you, and she walks you through the process mile by mile, road by road, and you are reliant on it because you're going to a place that you may not be able to navigate on your own, especially in, if you're not at home. You know, and it's it's definitely a similar relationship that we need to have with God, like we have with that app, where we are given over to its direction and we try to follow it implicitly or it will keep directing us if we change and make turns that we shouldn't. And, 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 and similarly, in our experience, here's where we find sometimes that God is redirecting because we keep, we keep making wrong turns and he's keep the redirecting, recalibrating, recalculating um, the course that we should take to get us to the destination that we need to be. But the shepherd is really one that directs and we are to follow his direction because his rod and staff will be a comfort unto us. I mean, thank you very much. I, I like the analogy of the GPA system. I think the modern day society would understand that a whole lot more than, you know, maybe the shepherd. So thank you for making it a bit modern. Elder Knowles? Yes, um, let's step back and pause a little bit because we have to take into context who wrote the psalm and what was his experience because he wrote from the mind of a shepherd, fully experienced. Okay, and so not only that a shepherd, he was also king. He was a leader and he had to make sure that his, his subjects are well provided for. However, having said that, um, let me say that um, David could not have written this without having an experience with God, right? I think this is critical to the discussion. He had an experience with God. And so now he was sharing his testimony. Now, and um, the, the, the important thing for me though, is, is what he said. He started out by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. And so because he is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I have everything that I want. So, uh, so, so, so in other words, he started out on, on the premise that there is no need to worry. You're already provided for as long as the Lord is your shepherd, okay? And this is what, this is what I think for me is so important. I don't need anything 
and it takes it takes you know a certain amount of um experience and relationship and this kind of thing and so on to be able to reach to this point where you're able to declare that this is actually the case because when you look at david his life was really up and down he went through many trials and tribulations you know as a soldier and as a king and so on he his life was just up and down turbulent but he is saying now what gives him consistency what brings consistency in his life what stabilizes him is the fact that jesus is his shepherd okay and so he he, he has no fear of anything and, and and if you know the life of, of um if you understand the life of david quite well we recognize it on several occasions he speaks about fear not fearing this and not fearing that because he knows that god is his leader that's the one whom he can trust in completely amen amen pastor Lee? yes um Elder um, knows dealt a lot with David, so I just want to come closer to home. How can I say that I will I lack nothing when the gas prices keep keeps going up, and uh, you know my salary is not getting any bigger. But the gas, gas price keeps rising. Yesterday, I went to the gas pump and I paid $220 to, put, to fill my tank, right? I remember not so long ago, it cost me $150 something dollars to put gas, but now it's $220. How can I say that I lack nothing when the bills are getting higher, when there are fees to be paid, when you know, things really, we're undergoing so many crises at this point. But here we see that, like the psalmist, we need to put full trust in God, who is our shepherd. He's the one who's guiding us. And my Bible tells me that the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. My Bible tells me that no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. David said, I was young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging in bread. My God shall supply all my needs, needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. And so when we look at who is leading us, we can have trust in him because we know he has the power, he has the ability, he has everything, so we lack nothing. And this is the key note to this psalm, that we can put our full trust in God because he's our shepherd who is guiding us. And with him, he has everything. God is all powerful. He's all present. He is omnipotent. He's omniscient. And so I can trust him even where I can trust. Amen. Amen. I'm so happy that you brought across the, the path of I shall not want because, you know, Lots of people today struggling with food prices. The gas price, yes, but for people who don't drive, the food price is even more critical. And every time you go into the supermarket, the price is just rising and rising and rising. And as you rightly said, Pastor Lee, our salaries are shrinking, shrinking, shrinking because the more you have to take out to pay, the less you have to do what you normally do. And so we would have looked at Psalms 23, Verse three, as our memory text. So I'm just going to ask a question. What is this part of righteousness that David is talking about here? And will this part be always prosperity and peace? What is this part of righteousness that Psalms 23, verse three speaks to? So we can with you, Elder Jarvis, then Elder Nose and Pastor Lee. Right then, I believe that God is more interested in um, making us who we want, who, who he wants us to be, than in giving us what we want. Um, reason being, our earthly situation is going to 
to change constantly. I think the only constant in earth is change. However, God says that he doesn't change. Amen. He is not alterable. Our earthly situations do not impact him. You know, and when we evaluate that idea, I believe that we'd be able to recognize that it's not about the ups and downs that we face. What God is looking for is something a little bit different. Now, what could that be? Well, I think the key thing is as we evaluate the word of God, we'd recognize that all of the Bible writers came to one simple suggestion, and that is the relationship that we have with God. They write it differently, and many of them came to it at various points and through different situations. David here is speaking of it through his vantage point, through his prism of a shepherd as he was, and even warrior and king, and he's able to articulate it in a way which reflected his experience. But ultimately, what is being suggested by everyone is a relationship with God for ourselves. Now, what does that look like? If we evaluate any other relationship, the things that are required, personal time, attention, caring, concern, um, being available, being able to help and assist in various times, one who is able to stand with another no matter what the situation is. And that is really what we need to be able to have with God. And when that happens, the fluctuating fuel prices and um, food prices will, yes, it, it still will happen, but it will not necessarily be our focus because God says he provides our daily bread. We may, we may not be able to buy Prego um, spaghetti sauce anymore, or we may not be able to buy the Ezekiel bread that we so like. However, we will not go hungry. And when we are able to find our way through the process, through the ups and downs of this inconsistent life, and recognize that God stands sure and He's leading us from this point of eternity to the next point we will be totally satisfied. Amen. Amen. Thank you so very much, Elder Jarvis. Elder Knowles? Yes. Um, let's talk about the reputation of the shepherd. In John chapter 10, verse 11, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so whatever the good shepherd does, it is predicated on love. Amen. Okay, so he doesn't he does not allow the sheep to just go astray and never um, um, run after the sheep. However, what we're looking at here is that he says that um, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. So he will lead you into the right paths. What is best mm -hmm. for you? All right. Um, so we, we look at these things and we never really most times we don't pause to think about the the struggle that the shepherd also has in order to, to provide for the sheep. It's not, it's not easy for the shepherd either, but the shepherd uh, that we're looking at here has a reputation. He is a righteous shepherd. And so his sheep will always be led into the right paths. And, and, and like it says, for his namesake, for his reputation sake, this is who he is. This is what he does. He does not know any other way to the extent that if he has to put down his life, he would put down his life. And so to those who are struggling today, those who are going to maybe parts that maybe seem dark, as long as the shepherd is with you, you are secure. You don't have to continue. Let's do my child's way. You don't have to continue to worry. Because um, worrying is a natural human tendency. It's time, sometimes we need to just pause for a while and just to see Jesus, see God for who he actually is. So he don't apart 
be dark and dreary. If we keep our eyes focused on God, we will also understand that even in the dark parts, that Jesus is still the light of the world. And so if you look on him, you're able to see righteousness personified, righteousness exemplified, and we will want to follow the path. Any way he leads me, I will go. Amen. Righteousness personified. Righteousness exemplified. Yes, um, in this psalm, we see that David brings out several characteristics of God, our shepherd. For the psalmist, we see God is the shepherd. He's the leader of my life. He's my provider. He's my protector. He's my restorer. He's my sustainer. He's my abiding companion. He's comforter. He's shelter. So God is everything. He's all and in all. And as our shepherd, he takes care of us in all aspects of our lives. So we have nothing to fear. We only have to display complete trust in a God who never fails. And so, like David, we can say with confidence, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Amen. Now, we move on to 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Again, same order, Elder Javis, Elder Knows Pastor Lee. What is this valley of death? What is this valley in the shadow of death? What does it reckon? Um, what is a symbolize? And what is the modern day example? And before you answer, I want you to realize that it is the shepherd who is leading through the valley. That's right. And why is this important for us? For our journey as Christians. I have three questions tied up there. What is this valley, shadow of death, the modern day example? Um, and why is it so important for us as Christians to recognize that it is the shepherd who is leading us in the valley, the shadow of death? Well, first of all, the, the pastor said, yea, though I walk. Uh, we can look at it also from the, the uh, if we read state with it, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Um, it is a situation that death is the most final thing that can happen to a human being. And when we are facing death, many of us uh, begin to become afraid. Uh, the despair sets over. We, 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 we are told that, you know, maybe we have an illness of some kind, and it takes over our minds, and we are totally uh, depressed and um, cast down because of things that may happen in our life situations. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So even though I face death, literally, I may have my circumstance or situation I may come to this point, I am still going to trust the shepherd as he guides. So there is, this is the ultimate situation that the, the, the Psalmist David is here creating, that the, the, the toughest one as for us as humans to deal with, and that is Mr. Death. Even though he comes and we face him with our good shepherd, the, the psalmist is telling us that we will be all right. And it has no reason to bring fear. You know, there, there are many times when we don't, we're not really facing death, but we think that our situation is dire. It is the worst that we have ever experienced. And it always seems like as time progresses, our situations get worse and um. Let me say it as we say locally, worse and worse, worse a you know, and we are able um, to sort of bring to um, the, 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 the forefront how bad our situations are. But the fact is, the facts are, they're never really as bad as we imagine in the moment. 
because after as elder knows indicated earlier after sometimes we look and we laugh at ourselves at how you know how disheveled and totally discombobulated we were in the moment and looking at it from the the, the, the looking back at it from the other side we are like you're really just a chicken um, you, 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 you really have some issues, man. You really need to work. Through. God, God help me. You know? And it's really for that sort of clarity why we go through our situation so that we can know who we really are. You know, a, a, a friend of mine always said that I can go through hell with a gasoline suit on as long as I go with Jesus. And that really is the truth of the matter. No matter what we face, as long as God goes before us, we can use the example of the three Hebrew boys. As long as God is in that fire with us, we will be okay. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so very much, Elder Jarvis, Elder Noah. Yes, um, so the pastor speaks about um, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Um, let, me, let me say this, the, the shadow of death is not necessarily death. Okay, so you have to be, um, be careful. It may appear to be death. Now, um, however, let, 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 me, let, me, let me say this because I think this is so important. When you look back at, at, the, at the experience of David and we see how, you know, the predators, you know, I, I, and the way that they do have, uh, that the function has not changed up until now. They would ambush, they would lie in the dark places and look for an opportunity to pounce, to destroy the sheep. All right? And so this is what, that's what used to, um, used to happen. And in, 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 um, in, in, in a less sense, right? We personally, those of us who drive, I think we go through that experience every day, the valley of the shadow of death and the hills of the shadow of death because people tend to be extremely crazy and like they don't put any value on the life of the other individual that is on the street. However, however, what for me is critical is that David is saying, no matter what my experience is, no matter where I am, as long as God is with me, I am not afraid. I am not afraid because what he said in essence, even if, I mean, I mean, bring it down to our experience, even if we're faced with death or uh, even if we die, there is hope beyond the grave because God is with me, not just now in just this experience, but he'll be with me throughout eternity. So long as God is there, I am not afraid. And I think this is so important. Thank you so very much, Eleanor's Pastor Lee. Yes, um, shadow of death as um, both of my companions um, reveal, has to do with deep dark um, crucibles that we go through at times, be it death or some very serious situation as sickness or whatever. But, here the psalmist is saying that even though going through those deep, dark valleys, that God has still promised that he is abiding presence. And, you know, when I look at Psalm 91, Psalm 91 speaks about, uh, it, it says, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night. Notice what happens by night, the terror. And it says, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness. So we see here that um, these are things that, experiences that we go through that are deep, that are dark, that may be so traumatic that it may sometimes even cause us to wonder, is God there? Or it may sometimes cause our faith to to um, tremble at times, but the psalmist is saying here that God is with me. It says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And when we look at the, um, the reason for this rod and the staff, 
the staff there, whenever there was an alarm or that maybe fell over a precipice or something, the shepherd would use that staff to really lift that sheep. And the rod is there not so much to drive us away, but sometimes the, the, the deep, deep dark experience is there to discipline us, to bring us back to God. When God sees us going in the wrong direction, he allows discipline, us to be disciplined by certain experiences that would bring us clo into a closer relationship with him. And so instead of becoming, you know, throwing away our faith, casting off our faith, when we go through these deep, dark moments, we can learn to trust in the shepherd who never fails and who has promised his abiding presence, who has promised to comfort us, to guide us, and to keep us until that day when we shall see him face to face. Amen. Now, guys, just a minute. I'm just going to share some of the comments that we are getting from our viewers. And then we'll jump to um, 23, Psalms 23, verse 5. And so we have, Barbara Buckley says, yes, we keep making wrong turns, but may God direct our footsteps today in Jesus' name. Thank you so very much, Sister Buckley. Christine Aaron says, thank God for his love for us. Indeed, we are grateful for his love. Patricia Johnson says, thanks to the host and the panelists for sharing this lesson study. May the Lord continue to equip you with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Thank you, Sister Johnson. Coralita Joseph says, yes, he has already provided everything we need. Thank you, Jesus. Coralita also says, hallelujah. What an awesome God we serve. We want to thank our viewers for sharing in this study with us. It helps us to know that we are reaching you and keep setting us your comments and your questions so my wonderful partner is doing a great and awesome job we get to the unexpected detour too the surrounded table and it says you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup runneth over psalms 23 verse 5 Wow, enemies. As Christians, should we have them? So I'm friendly, you know, we're going on the same order. Elder Jarvis, Elder Laws, Pastor Lee. So let me give you the punch questions one time. So when you talk, you address all of them. As Christians, should we have enemies? And if you say we have them, how should we treat them or handle them? And then I'll come back with the other question. Does these two tie? And then there's one more. Uh, I see Ellis Jarvis laughing. You know, go ahead. As Christians, should we have enemies? Well, no one should be an enemy of mine. But we may find that persons have us as enemies. Um, even after all of us seeking to do what God wants us to do in going to them and seeking restitution, seeking to resolve our issues and so forth, we will still find that there are persons who just won't deal with you, that they just won't care for you. I think that is, that's what life is all about. Um, but should we have persons in our hearts as enemies? No, I don't think so. I think what the psalmist was really suggesting is even though there are persons who are intent on doing harm, even in their presence, God is going to cause you to flourish. God is going to water you. He is going to make you blossom. He's going to make you bloom, even despite all of their efforts. And it is because we are connected with him. Um, it's not a situation where we are there, we're, we're, we're out for evil, we're out for blood, and we're, you know, we're looking and plotting and planning someone's demise but we are fully confident and trusting in God and the relationship that we have with him. And in doing so, God knows our hearts and he is able to shield us. Remember what Satan said to God when he went in Job chapters one and two, he said to God, hey, haven't you placed a hedge about him that I can't touch him? Well, if Satan can't touch you, how much more another human being? So really and truly, the fact is when the shepherd protects. 
we have absolutely nothing to fear. We, you're going to be like a, 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 a fruitful mango tree throwing out its hundreds, whether or not you have enemies around with chainsaws to cut you down. They will never get to your back because you are fully protected. You fully protected by God. We may not be able to see it, but God is in the business of security. I just want for us to remember that even in the presence of those who consider you to be an enemy and want to do you harm, God is our protector. Amen. Thank you so very much. Eleanor? Um, should I have enemies? No. But are there benefits of having enemies? It may sound strange. Oh, yes, there are benefits. Because God has left a formula for us to follow. He said, do good to them who despitefully use you and persecute you. So that's, my, that's a test for me, my metal, to see if I can endure my crucible. Right? And so... During the times of um, adversity, I learned that Jesus, who is my leader, has been through his crucibles and has had enemies right through his earthly sojourn. But was he successful? Yes. Did he still bless others? Yes. Did that change his mind from his journey? No, it didn't. It, that never happened. Okay. And so, and so for me, for me, right, I'm comforted in the fact that it does that I, it doesn't matter what my situation is as long as jesus is with me that's what matters most i can do all three things sorry through christ who strengthens me should i have enemies yes the bible tells us that satan is our enemy and he's the accuser of the brethren. Not only that, but Jesus tells us he didn't come to send peace on earth, but a sword. Right? And he's come to send the mother against the, the children and the children and so forth and so on. When you become a child of God, Satan has his agents. And of course, he will use them against you. So yes, you will have enemies. But that does not necessarily mean that you, will, you should go about seeking enemies. They will come because... The Bible tells us when you become a child of God, you are hated of all men, just as how they hated Christ. But God has promised that, like in the story, the introductory story, we see there that young lady who, you know, she was betrayed. And uh, it, you know, she went into um, great sadness. She was going through her crucibles. yes. Because of our enemies, those whom Satan has um, put against us. And um, God has promised that in these times of crucibles, when our enemies come in like a flood, that the spirit of the Lord will lift us down against them. And so God, in the presence of our enemies, when they are looking on to see what evil will befall us, when they are looking on happy that we are going through our crucibles, God without warning, without the expectation, God will spread before us a team. He will bless us. And so when they, and sometimes what the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. Look at Joseph that we, was, we have been studying about. When his brothers meant evil, he didn't have them as enemies, but they had him as enemies. What they meant for evil, it led God to fulfill his plan, his promise for Joseph's life. He became the leader there in the land of Egypt. And so, yes, we will have enemies as long as we're children of God. But God has promised to spread a table before us, even in the presence of our enemies. Amen. And so we have some of our viewers sharing with us. Juliet Sargent says, we'll have them enemies. But we are asked to live peaceably with all men 
But like Christ and Joseph, we will have people who hate us. We, however, should have the spirit of Christ and love in spite. Thank you so very much, Miss Juliet Sargent. And I need to cast us from the time we end, from the time we end into our relationship with the shepherd, we inherited enemies. Plus, we have self as an enemy. Thank you so very much, Sister Anita Carr. We are fully on board with both of your comments. And so Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So people may be used, they may be instruments of the enemy, but Paul is telling us we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So, so all of us in Whisper and Hope Land, yes, enemies will come upon us. Lots of time, not of our own doing. But the psalmist tells us that in front of our enemies, God is going to anoint us. He's going to celebrate us. He's going to bless us. He's going to let the whole world know that that's my child. And the blessing that flows is because she's connected to me. And so let's not be afraid. Thank you so very much to all of our panelists. And so we get to a certain promise for the journey. And so we get to Psalm 23, verse 6. It says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Same order, Jarvis, Elder Knowles, Pastor Lee. What do you understand by this text? That goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Goodness, mercy, um, what does it look like? We, if we think about the ultimate goal, and the ultimate goal for us should be heaven at last, then we would see the goodness and mercy in the, from the perspective of our process of cleansing. Um, we are not going to need mercy unless we are errant. Um, mercy covers the faults and failures that um, we display on a regular basis, being in contravention of the character of God. Um, and so, because we are going to um, be inconsistent in our walk, how do we account for his goodness? His goodness is this being able to receive from him that which is what we do not deserve. And his grace covers, his grace reassures, it reestablishes, places us back on the path where we are walking towards eternity. And hence we get to the end of the passage, which says, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And, and, and here's, that's the ultimate goal. That's where we, we, we desire to get to. That's where we want to reach. Because being a part of this travailing up and down experience in this world, it makes no sense to live in hell and then die and go to hell. So we really need to be able to endure this process. We need to be able to receive God's mercy, understanding that our, our human frailties will um, be what it is, but God is still merciful. God is still good. And as long as his goodness is being expressed, 
we will be recipients of that which he has prepared for all of us. So the, 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 this, this chapter really, the, the, the shepherd's psalm should really help us to come to an understanding of who God really is. He is not one to be afraid of. He is one to, for us to run to and, and be comforted that he has our best good at heart. And from that premise, all will be well. Amen. Thank you so very much, Elder Jarvis. Elder Knowles? Yes, um, permit me to just back up a little bit, right? Because um, we recognize that in the, in the Eastern culture, when you visit someone as a guest and you get that special treatment, they will anoint their head with oil and then they will put you by a table and they, they, the spread is more than you can eat. Right, so you're treated like a king. Now here it is, after all this, here's what David is saying. Surely, for sure, your goodness and your love will follow me because it comes out of a life of experience. This is my experience I'm sharing now. Your goodness and your mercy is consistent. It will never fail because I've been through the valley of the shadow of death with all the parts you have led me or fed me and all these things. I can attest, now this is my testimony, your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life. So even if I'm not out in the pasture, when I get back into the pen, I know I'm well taken care of. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because he's the greatest protector ever. He's the greatest provider ever. He's the greatest lover ever. And he is the one that can place my trust and my confidence in. Amen. Amen. Thank you so very much, Eleanor. Pastor Lee? One of my favorite passages of scripture is found in Romans 8 and verse 28. It says, Our things work together for good, but then that love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. All things are not good, but everything, whether good or bad, whatever situation comes into my life, the crucibles as well as the, the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows, they work together for good. As we see these two words, your goodness and mercy, God's kindness, his grace, and whatever situation comes into our lives. We see God's presence with us. He never leaves us. He never abandons us. It doesn't matter whether you're going high or you're up high on the mountain <clears throat> or you're going through your valley experience. God's graciousness is kindness. His goodness will come running after us, will always be there for us. So we can keep trusting in him, knowing that he will never abandon us. He will never fail us. And his kindness, even though we go through our deep sorrows, our crucibles, it does not mean that God is not good. God is good all the time and all the time, God. Amen. And before we wrap up, I just want to share a few more comments coming from our lovely viewers here on Whispering Hope Land. And um, Juliet Sargent says, thank you. I love studying Whispering Hope. I just love this family of God. And I love being a part of the family, my sister. God bless you. And we're so happy that you love studying with us. And we encourage you to continue to be part of this family of God. Patricia Johnson said, as long as we are called children of God, we will have enemies. Thank you so very much, Sister Johnson. She also says, Jesus was perfect and he had enemies. Thank you again. And Barbara Buckley says, amen, hallelujah. Elder Jarvis, yes, God is in the business of security. She has a lot of these emojis up. Hands up to say that she is. Sadly, to all of us here in Whispering Hope Land, our well time spent is over. And so I just want to share a last passage with you that talks about the crucibles of the shepherd. You see, Luke, Luke 15, 1 to 6, 1 to 7 talks about it. It says, this good shepherd, very, very good shepherd, he had a hundred sheep. 
and one of them went missing. Yeah? What did he do? He left the 90 and 9, wherever they were. He left the 90 and 9. And he struggled. He went back. He looked over the cliffs, the edges, all the spots where danger lurked for this one sheep. He left the 90 and 9 to search for one. Now let's look at it in business stats. If I have 100, I lose one. That's a loss of one. I still have 99 remaining, but 99 with God is not enough. He wants all. He wants the 100 sheep. And so he left the 90 and 9, went searching for the one. This morning, you may be that one. Christ is searching for you. He's a good shepherd. He've sacrificed his life for you. He went to the cross to save you. Question to all of you. Will you give him your life? Have a good day. God bless. And happy Sabbath. Yes, happy Sabbath to you as well.